Yeah, really happy to be with you all. It's been a couple of weeks. It's been a, a, a nice time to reflect on Wednesday evenings and their relative emptiness without you all there. And uh, also take a little time myself to kind of recover a bit. Uh, some of you know I was part of a really incredible summit that launched on May 2nd through May 5th. And all of those teachings um, that were guided by His Holiness the Dalai Lama are still freely available. I really recommend them. Some really nice pith teachings on emotion and emotion awareness. This evening, we are proceeding, of course, fearlessly through the Lojong. And the slogan tonight, it really follows up on the, the last two slogans, really giving us this invitation to focus specifically on how do we throughout the day and actually in the evening tether our mind to bodhicitta so it's this slogan is two activities one at the beginning one at the end a bit innocuous but i assure you by the end i think you'll you'll find it quite useful and practical i've heard this teaching uh, actually as a, a separate experience completely taken out of the lojan itself it's really simple instructions on how do we literally begin our day and then how do we end our day? And quite fortunately, since we are here together at the end of the day, I'll give us a meditation practice that absolutely is a support for our shamatha, for our attention, but a meditation practice that also really invites retrospective awareness. So developing this capacity and quality to kind of look backwards and reflect and highlight possibly areas and times which we might have fallen away from our bodhicitta. Because it's been at least a couple of weeks since I've gotten to be with you all, I'm gonna invite us to start with the preliminaries. As um, those of you I am fortunate to see more often know, I think whew, starting with the preliminaries never ever gets old. It's so unbelievably important. I had the good fortune to be sitting um, with my teacher this weekend and she uh, at one point really had us resting with a very broken open heart with impermanence. And to be able to find that kind of tenderness with impermanence, it actually can help us drop into meditation. So it's like everything we're fighting against, like, oh, I want to be more comfortable, or did I get my cup of tea? And where's my notebook? All the kind of agitations, they just get a bit cut through when we have that face-to-face -face meeting with impermanence. And the Lojong slogans, all of these teachings, they are these tiny little, um, almost like mental barbs. They kind of, they get stuck in our mind and we have to work our way around them. And in that process of working our way around them, we stop taking things just as they are. We start being really curious and applying this kind of wisdom um, this introspection of, huh, yeah, what is it like to just be in this mind and this body? And what is it like to deeply cultivate bodhicitta as the first thing of my day? And then what is it like even to reflect on the day that has passed and times which maybe I got a little far away from or loosened with my relationship to bodhicitta? So before we start our meditation, I want to just again, really welcome everybody to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. As far as we know, the only entirely volunteer run Dharma Center in the country, meaning the volunteers are truly not just here to give wonderful announcements and uh, support us all in our technical abilities to be here, but the volunteers run the center. Uh, myself and other fortunate teachers, we are invited to participate, but we are not in charge. And that's just an incredible, um, yeah, unique experience of manifesting the Sangha as the Buddha, that our community here is really the teacher. And as such, I really invite you to hold one another, not just as people who randomly showed up in the Brady Bunch Zoom squares today, but that this around you, this constellated, each person in the box here is part of your spiritual path and awakening that we are here for each other because of each other. So that's my, my intention for us all this evening is to have that kind of sense of deep connection and community. 
In order to do so, I really invite you to bring a mindfulness to your body, your speech, and your mind. So where, whether it is how you're kind of moving about, you know, if you have to move um, and don't bring your computer with you and accidentally make everybody feel a little car sick as you move around to find a plug or a more comfortable place. So being mindful of our body and being mindful of our speech, our inner speech and our outer speech, what we might say to one another and being especially mindful of our thoughts maybe not getting so caught up in um, things that aren't quite right or someone who accidentally unmuted during the meditation. You know, we're really coming here with generosity and with openness and care for each other and treating again, each part of our experience here as the teaching, um, including some of the challenges or difficulties. And I do think in what I've been just missing on my Wednesday nights is the wonderful communication and community that we've been building this year, especially. So we will have an opportunity to connect and talk with each other. And when we do so, I will um, maybe reinvigorate our, our adherence to the core ethic of non-harming. How can we be really kind to each other? Uh, sneak preview, it doesn't mean telling other people how they should live their life. Right, not fixing it for other people, not giving suggestions. Like, how do we create just this kind of loving, open presence for one another here together so we can feel heard and connected? So, a lot of preamble. Let's go ahead and find our posture. And I was, again, just very motivated and inspired this weekend by the emphasis that my teacher was bringing back over and over around our posture. And how our posture, of course, it, it helps us stay awake for practice, which is really useful after 7 p.m. But that our practice really is, as she would say, a bridge between heaven and earth. We can think of our posture as the first way we invite the sacredness of this human body. And so in, in doing, we want to find the uprightness of the spine. It could help to inhale your shoulders up to your ears. And then exhale them down your back. And allow yourself to circle around the spine a bit. Maybe you can lean right, and lean left, and then backwards and forwards. And find the place where you feel truly balanced, the body of balance inviting the mind and heart of balance. Feeling a sense of this body in whatever space that you're sitting or lying down or standing right now. So with eyes closed, noticing what can be noticed in the room. Maybe there's a lingering smell of food. Maybe there's subtle sounds in the background or not so subtle sounds in the background. And just sense the ceiling above you, the floor below you, the walls and the windows. And re-inviting this beautiful image of earth below. Feeling the solidity, solidity and stability of the earth below.
and feel or imagine this sense of heavens or sky above. So we begin our practice with these preliminaries. I'll say each of these four preliminaries and allow them to settle into the mind, the heart and the body without overthinking, without analyzing, just notice the impact. And the first of these preliminaries is Maintain an awareness of the preciousness of human life. Moving on to our second of these preliminaries. Be aware of the reality that life ends. Death comes for everyone. Now gently shifting to this third preliminary. Recall that whatever you do, whether virtuous or not, it has a result. In our fourth preliminary practice, contemplate that as long as you are focused on self-importance, caught up in thinking about whether you are good or bad, you will experience suffering. Obsessing about getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want does not result in happiness.
the sobering wisdom of these preliminary practices invite us to see clearly how precious this human life is in our ability to learn and grow, to shift and change, to wake up. And that this life is so fast, everything large and small moves so quickly. And yet everything we do matters so much. Everything small and everything great, all our decisions, behaviors and activities. And yet a focus on our own well-being exclusively does not bring happiness. And it's from the meditation upon these preliminary practices that we can deliberately and with confidence choose bodhicitta. Choose to wake up our own hearts with the dedication that this life is meant to be here and of service for all beings. And to be the best instruments we can in service of others, we must attend to our, our mind and our heart and our body. And so we'll shift now into this practice of retrospective awareness, a practice of developing attention and deepening insight into the nature of our day-to-day -day lived experience noticing moment by moment where we fall asleep, where we forget, where we become disconnected from this core necessity and imperative of bodhicitta. So we begin by going back in time to when you first open your eyes this morning. Do you remember what was the quality of light or darkness in the room? Can you remember the first thoughts? Do you remember feeling rested or still tired? And we move ahead in time, maybe to a first beverage that you had this morning, tea or coffee or water and seeing if you can recall a single moment, maybe standing in front of hot water or smelling the scent of coffee or tea. And can you recall what was the quality of your heart and your mind? Was there peace and ease? Was there worry and rumination? Was there a sense of being in the body, in the moment? And gently we'll move ahead in time. In this retrospective awareness practice, we try not to engage in too much analytical thought, not trying to fix or change what happened, just a snapshot, a memory. 
So choose a point sometime in the middle of the morning. Maybe you are talking with another person, maybe working, maybe outside. Again, choosing one moment and recalling what was going through your mind? What was the quality of your heart? Were you in your body? Moving ahead in time to somewhere in the afternoon and choose a moment, nothing special, nothing necessarily important, but just a moment. And again, with vivid detail, recall what was happening. What was the quality of your heart and your mind in that moment? What was the presence in your body? Moving ahead in time now, maybe the half hour before we all gathered here together virtually. Again, just choose a moment and consider and recall what was the quality of mind and heart? Was there an experience of presence in the body? And then moving ahead in time to this moment. Noticing the quality of heart and mind right now. Fully arriving in the body. And attend closely to this moment as it leads to this next moment and this next moment. And do so with this intention and aspiration of bodhicitta very close by.
And hopefully for a breath or two, we can experience this beautiful homecoming, returning to ourself, our body, our breath, and finding this bodhicitta, uncontrived, just a genuine and spontaneous sense of caring. And from where we are in this moment, aware, connected. Of course, thoughts and memories and images will arise, but we're hosting them from this place of stability and presence. And consider just looking backwards at the day, at these moments, and thoughtfully, not harshly, considering when we might have lost our thread of bodhicitta in the day. Did we arouse bodhicitta when we first woke? Was it close to how we moved through the day? Sometimes, all of the time. The purpose here is not to get down on ourselves, but to look closely and notice. And releasing this looking backwards, reconnecting to the simple, spontaneous feeling of care for other beings right here and now. And imagine prospectively considering tomorrow. Tomorrow, is it possible to wake up really infuse the mind, heart, and body with bodhicitta. Can we bring this intention and motivation throughout our day tomorrow?
You could even imagine some of the people or experiences we anticipate tomorrow. Prospectively extending this sense of care. And gently, once again, coming back to this present moment, resettling into the breath and the body. And simply following the natural rhythm of the breath, noticing the inhale and the exhale. Thank you for your practice. Would love to hear from folks, reflections, questions, thoughts on that practice. It, it is so aligned with our slogan today, which is two activities, one at the beginning, one at the end. Leanne, I see your hand. Oh no, you're not able to unmute. Oh, I think that's on us. Give us one second. Okay, give it a try now. Hi. Hi. I can't turn my video on, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just stare at my very colorful photo. It is, it's a nice one. Um, thank you for that. I've been looking forward to this all week um, out of desperate need. <laughs> I'm. Um, preparing to move cross country and uh, have, so the slogan, the, the, the last principle that you uh, shared about not getting caught up in both 
what I paraphrase as the desire and the aversion, like that we're stressing so much about our own well being. I'm so caught, I am stressing so hard right now to avoid being stressed out later. Like all I'm worrying about is trying to get like the perfect, because I still don't know where I'm going to land when I get to New York and it's like very soon. And, you know, I'm like, well, I could stay here, but the, and so I'm like noticing just so much suffering. My nervous system is shot right now mm. from this like, you know, desperate root chakra need to like line things up perfectly or you know, or then I won't be able to meditate, <laughs> like if I don't have the right space. And so I'm wondering, um, like, what is the actual practice during the day? Like, is there something beyond just dropping in to meditate or when you meditate to really address that in particular? Yeah. Um, yes, moving. Wow. One of the great bardos of transition. Um, it's, it's very, it's very challenging. And, and I think you named it so well, which is a desire to, to control the outcome, right? That's what we want and have some sense of ability. Um, you know, I don't know if it's hers originally, but Tara Brock so beautifully talks about kind of welcoming these moments that are a bit um, persistent, especially, right? The kind of ongoing and just relentless with, um, oh, and this too, Uh uh-huh, and this too. So you don't need to sit and meditate. Sometimes it's really hard to sit and meditate when there's so much kind of momentum with planning, Um, but that kind of counteractive of not only not only am I so occupied being busy and planning, I don't want to be occupied, busy and planning. Instead, just kind of welcoming it, I think is really kind, right? Because a lot needs to get done. You can't not do anything. You can't just relax and be at ease. That would actually be probably counterproductive to what needs to happen. So then how do you kind of meet what's happening? I do think pretty much um, as always, finding a way to feel kind of stable in the belly um, and stable in the body. And that might mean if possible, like can you literally lay belly down on the floor for 30 seconds and just kind of connect and bring the energy down. But that welcoming, that gentleness too, because this idea that there's a separation between our Dharma and our meditation and the rest of life, that, that gets in the way. There's no separation. It's all part of the practice. So, yeah, I hope that's helpful. There's some really wonderful, uh, I guess they'll be opening soon, Dharma centers in New York too. So that's, that'll be wonderful. Oh, that's good. I'll get the recommendation. Yeah. yeah it's, it's feeling like a bad Buddhist in terms of when, like, or, <laughs> which I don't, act, I don't have guilt about it. I don't mean it like that. I'm like, oh, right. Like, this is why I'm suffering because I'm behaving in a way that's counter because it's not just the busyness it's the like aversion and craving like I I don't want this situation and I really need this situation and only under the the circumstances will I have any inner peace yeah (laughs) like that right there is not yeah yeah and you know peace peace just looks a lot of different ways um again I, I really wish I remember which teacher shared this but um this idea of being like kelp right? So you're very firmly rooted on the bottom of the ocean, but you're just kind of getting thrashed around on top. But knowing that firm root, right, that really, truly at the core, there's this imperturbable natural essence of our basic goodness. And it may seem like there's so much, you know, that we need to do to make sure it's okay, but it's always okay. And as you said, just kind of managing the real stress of moving and a lot of choices in the meantime. You're so welcome. Thanks for being here. Anyone else? I see here. I just wanted to interject um, that we got confused about the settings and we disabled the ability for people to turn on their videos, but we fixed that now. Oh, turn it on, everybody. Would like to. And then also the (laughs) chat and everything's open too. We were just. That was my fault having technical issue so that so there 
just wanted to say that to everyone. Okay, that's healthy remorse. We like it. <laughs> Um, actually, one of the nice parts of the teaching tonight is on, you know, at the, we did this kind of looking back on the day and um, I will, I will model this behavior, but I really was aware of when I lost track of Bodhicitta um, mid morning, let me just scroll here through. Okay, good. I don't see anyone who was on my call this morning. Um, I was on a call this morning at my, in my work setting and I was so checked out, so checked out. And I was contributing to being more checked out by like looking on the internet for um, a swimsuit. I'll just be totally honest. I need a new swimsuit. And that's what was happening. And it created, it didn't create like profound suffering, but it meant that I was so disconnected from what was happening. Like I missed out on the opportunity for authentic human connection with my colleagues, for being able to focus when what was actually happening. And I know that like some part of me is like, oh, you need to do this. Like you don't have enough time. Like this will be great. You'll multitask. It was just awful. And I really lost track of here's other humans who are fully showing up. Well, more or less, they could also be shopping for swimsuits. <laughs> Hard to say, but I, you know, it, it just, it was so antithetical to, um, yeah, my commitment to be of service to all beings. And so I think it's, you know, I can see that. I actually do think it was funny. Um, but when we look back at our day with this slogan of kind of noticing where we fall away from bodhicitta, we can easily create it as a kind of, you know, a way to self-castigate. And, and that's not what we want. And there's a bit of description on healthy remorse. And Alan Wallace actually says that, I didn't know this, that there's no word for guilt in Tibetan but there is a word for healthy remorse. So looking back and being like, yeah, online shopping while you're in a meeting. Hmm, has that ever really worked out? No, okay. Like maybe let's uh, prospectively fully show up to your meeting tomorrow um, and see what that feels like. Okay. Um, so, and then I see Denise here. Oh, maybe this was just to me. Um, Okay, yes, this idea of, um, oh good, someone's asking if bodhicitta is, this idea that really going throughout our day to get a sense of where we fall asleep, right? Where we lose track. Um, so I really love when someone asks a question like, what is bodhicitta? Because it gives me an opportunity to do that teacher thing, which is beautiful Sangha, what's bodhicitta? Let's help each other out here. Anyone want to share there? And it doesn't have to be, you know, the best definition, but your understanding. How is bodhicitta alive for you? So bodhicitta. <laughs> um, I think it's the ability to let your heart sing with every with every breath. Hmm. I think it's the ability to pull out the allies. <laughs> <laughs> That's my short definition. Beautiful. Oh, Thank you, Ramit. That's lovely. Anyone else? Yeah, if, hmm. even yes. though you, I can't see myself and I guess you can see. The way I understand it is like trying to be our best towards our human fellow human beings, you know, practicing the things that we have been learning of compassion and empathy and loving kindness and empathetic joy. Hmm. I don't know. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I saw another one in the chat here. When my heart beats in harmony with life and others. Hmm, that beautiful. is beautiful. Anybody else? Don't worry, it's not a pop quiz. I know we talk about it all the time. Um, Lindsay is saying, I think of it as when my heart is cracked open to the world's suffering and beauty. Hmm.
Yeah, and I think what's so um, wonderful about really narrowing in or kind of going deeper into this idea of, of what is bodhicitta, um, we, we see that there's a couple qualities of it that are, that are quite important and worthwhile. You might have heard me say this kind of spontaneous feeling. And with bodhicitta, I often think of it as it, it's not something we effort towards. It's the fruition. It's kind of what naturally arises, what spontaneously arises. When we really, you know, kind of see clearly like the world as it is, all of our hopes and our fears, all of the ways we try to take refuge in many different things and experiences that actually <laughs> won't support us. So I think this idea of like a spontaneous instead of a explicit feeling of the awakened heart. So bodhicitta is literally right our awakened heart. There's a wonderful story. Um, I may have said it in, in this group before, but I was just uh, hanging out with this old favorite book today, the, the Beyond Religion. Some of you old school folks, remember we, when we met in person, this was the last book that we were going through together. And His Holiness talks about this great story um, with actually some of the scientists involved in the summit I was describing in the very beginning of tonight. And these scientists were so interested in, in looking at compassion, especially for these monks in a monastery who'd been, who'd been there for years and years, some for decades. And these, they were so interested in, hmm, what changes in the brain, what changes in our thought patterns and our brain waves. Uh, with this prolonged experience of meditation and compassion. And that was really confusing for one of the first monks who agreed to say like, okay, you can measure my compassion. I don't know why one would ever need to do that. And they took out this kind of swim cap looking thing and put it on this monk's head. And he just busted out laughing. Uh, not just because it was funny looking to have like a swim cap with all these different wires, but they're like, you're studying compassion here? It's here, right? And so this interesting kind of um, difference of understanding in a way of like this bodhicitta, this heart awakening or this heart mind, and that it is really coming at this whole visceral level. Um, so I often, I feel the bodhicitta has kind of like an essence, kind of a felt sense and, you know, um, yeah, I, I think it's 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 enormously personal. And it is that I think it's it's this kind of real gentle surrender to how important it is that we all are here for one another. And that's why, you know, those preliminary practices are so sweet. I mean, they're not actually that sweet, they're kind of hard, but they're so sweet because they remind us of what really matters um, and what's so important. And when we talk about bodhicitta, uh, we, we can talk about our relative and our ultimate bodhicitta. And it's really important for us to really keep both of these in mind. So our relative bodhicitta on a day-to-day -day basis is how we go about, like how I go about not buying a swimsuit during a meeting, right? That's my everyday, you know, disrespect to my colleagues and myself by doing so. And then the ultimate is an ability to care for and take into my heart every single amount of suffering of every being. And as I say it, it actually is emotional to like um, open up to that possibility, like everyone on the planet, every single being, that we could have that capacity to hold in our heart that much pain, that much trouble. And, you know, in this, um, in this Sangha, we've talked about just how outrageous it is to hold open that possibility of absolute bodhicitta. And, um, and it's so needed. I keep um, wondering, <laughs> you know, every, every Wednesday evening that I'm teaching, I'm like, wow, another, you know, very challenging and painful time in the world. Another perfect time for Lojong, you know? Um, and it's another time that we're being asked to open our hearts. And it's just, it's just unbelievable. And yet it has to be believed because this, these are the conditions of this world. 
Um, so <clears throat> when we think of bodhicitta, I, I feel like it's an essential quality for us to hold uh, and to be able to be with the suffering of the world. And what's interesting, you know, with, with bodhicitta is we do, we can train in it explicitly. And Claudia was kind of uh, motioning us there that part of our training in bodhicitta are the four measurables, loving kindness, uh, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. So explicitly doing those practices. And we've been doing quite a lot of Tonglen here together. We can also practice bodhicitta through lojong, through these very teachings in which we really intentionally imagine exchanging ourselves through others in Tonglen. And, you know, a lot of these slogans really invite us to put others above us, in front of us. But part of bodhicitta is, is not just breaking down the barriers between us and others, but in some ways elevating. I spoke uh, maybe a number of months ago about this relationship, creating a relationship that's instead of, you know, I and you or I and that, a relationship that is I and thou, which was coined by the philosopher Martin Buber, a really beautiful idea of how do we think about a sacred, truly uh, bodhicitta infused relationship with all other beings. And we can also practice it through the paramitas, through our spiritual qualities. So these are these, again, kind of like aspirations and things that we try to strengthen on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can think of these as our, our vitamins. So generosity and virtue, patience, my all-time favorite um, because of how hard it is and how helpful it is, effort, uh, meditation, insight, and in some traditions, there's a couple more of these paramitas. So that's a bit about bodhicitta. Um, and then, okay, well, I'm just, I like, I have so much joy with your background today. I don't know. I like, I'm so, so in love with that. Wow. Um, and Walt shares loving and caring for that orphan, sweet, loving kitten for eight weeks and letting him go to someone's home. Oh, my. So is this your kitten? Oh, my gosh. Ah, um, wow. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Actually, he's uh, uh, his <laughs> they give him the funniest names. Uh, SPCA. That is Splinter. And Splinter is, well, we've also got Havarti and Gouda, <laughs> but that's Splinter. And he's probably about, I don't know, maybe four to six weeks old. He's, mm. uh, he comes from one of the rural counties and he's got ringworm. And we treat uh, ringworm cats for typically six to eight weeks, but that is the sweetest kitten. He's so young, but he's not afraid of of humans the way a lot of kittens that age are it just like waddles on up sits in your lap you know, comes comes up starts purring loves to be pet you know but it, it's a constant thing because mm -hmm. uh doing volunteer work over there um uh, and working with cats kittens primarily infected with ringworm one after the other you know, it's like falling in love with them, socializing them, because it's really important at that young age to be socialized and helping them along and making sure they're eating and all of that good stuff um, and treating them uh, medically and then saying, OK, I'm in love with this cat, but I'm going to have to let it go, you know, and it's going to be happy. And ultimately, I'm going to be happy because, wow, it's like I'm spreading the joy. This is going mm -hmm. to be one of the greatest cats in the world because it's received so much attention over an eight week period. So mm -hmm. that that's like bodhicitta. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I kind of want that cat already. I'm. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and you know, I think what you point out, um, which in which it also shows up in the commentary for this slogan, is if we're doing good work, but it's self-serving, 
it's still not gonna actually be transforming our hearts. So you could be doing this work at the SPCA, like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm helping these kittens, I'm giving them love. And that's just, that's just what I do. You know, it's, you're not really like extending this awareness to its impact. And it doesn't matter if, you know, we earn income for doing good work in the world. It doesn't mean, oh, if you earn income, then it's no longer, you know, just your true benevolent heart. Absolutely not. But our intention and motivation really matter. And having that clarity that you described of knowing that this is the seed of joy for someone else and being able to hold it lightly um, instead of having, I guess, a whole house full of kitties, <laughs> which is the other uh, outcome of that. But yeah, so beautiful. Oh, no, I see your hand. Hey, hey, Eve. Hey, everyone. Nice I've, I've been thinking about um, what you said. I think it was it the Tibetan language that doesn't have a word for guilt, but has a word for remorse. And I, I, I keep thinking about this and just what you said now made me want to say something out loud, which is that while we uh, don't want to do things that are self-serving and why, while, you know, many many of the teachings tell us to hold others above ourselves we also don't want to that's not like knocking ourselves down and and you know the same compassion we extend to others we we have to extend to ourselves to to really do the right thing in this world you know and i'm wondering i know i've heard it said that that uh you know other that you know, monks from Thailand or whatever, some other cultures don't, and I shouldn't say other because there might be someone Thai here, but some cultures in comparison to, uh, you know, American standard culture, uh, have a, a different relationship with themselves and don't, you know, uh, knock themselves so hard. And I wonder if that is like a way of thinking of the difference between guilt and remorse. Guilt is like, oh, oh, I suck, you know, where remorse is like, huh, I could have done better. I mean, it's just a, it's a different relationship with yourself. And, and it's one that seems to have more compassion. Um, mm. So yeah, I mean, we all do things that, that we think later, I could have done better. But we don't, we can treat ourselves with compassion about those things, just as we hope to treat others when, when we think they could have done better. Yeah, no, I, I so appreciate you bringing that up. I think it's possible we might need to literally have that as an addendum to our bodhicitta every single day when we wake up in the morning and every single evening as we go to bed, you know, arousing that desire for ourselves and others. And, you know, just as you're saying, um, you know, for His Holiness the Dalai Lama and many traditional teachers are like, well, of course you're included. But most of us are like, oh, we're included in that? Oh wait, we are like every like everyone else also deserving, and so to, and to be explicit, it's really important, you know. And it's and it's interesting too. Something um, that really struck me when uh, I heard it the first time was this idea that whether we are piling on a sense of um, being so great or piling on a sense of being so terrible, both were just lost in. Um, self-absorption, right? And that's, and both kind of can create ultimately misery because we're distanced from others. Yeah. And it is, it is such an interesting thing in uh, kind of contemporary, I'd just say capitalist culture, you know, the, the individual focus and, and the misery it creates. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's really, and I think, you know, guilt, I actually, I think guilt is not a bad word in, in the English language, shame, is one that is stickier and it really is like, I suck, I'm bad. Um, guilt and remorse have a similar tone to me of kind of, mm, I did something bad and wrong. And what's so interesting about shame that we know from the, the research of, of Brene Brown and also from um, other research in developmental psychology is what helps us with shame is actually like vulnerability. Mm. And openness and, um, you know, kind of, pulling off the lid instead of trying to hide it inside. Thank you. Thank you.
If I have a question, please. And um, you know, in the in the Lojong is it talks about thinking about the suffering of others. And um, you know, I'm thinking about like world events and oftentimes in my meditations I do um, Tonglen, you know, but sometimes it just feels so overwhelming that mm -hmm. it feels almost like like giving up, you know, like I feel so powerless or kind of helpless, like what can I do, mm -hmm. you know, other than wishing that people don't suffer or don't, I mean, that they are safe, that they are fed, that they are sheltered, that, you know, I mean, sending good vibes, but it's just so hard. Yeah. So is there anything that you recommend that, uh, You know, yeah, I mean, Claudia, because I because I know you, you know, um, and, and I know myself, too, is um, we are doing what we can do for the world um, in a lot of ways. And, and we're not going to stop doing that. Um, you know, all the ways that, you know, we have within our our power and capacity. Um, we're putting our effort there to teach others and to be present with others and. I think it's it's just like unbelievably challenging to be able to kind of accept what is and what is outside of our control. It almost kind of goes back to Leanne's thing of right, like I I'm moving and I want to know that I'm going to be okay and that I'm going to have the right things and I'm going to be in the right place. And I think it's different, but that's idea of like I just I want to know that it's going to be a just world. Like I want to know that that suffering is going to end. Um, and how do we tolerate the not knowing? Um, it's so, so hard. And there is, you know, we, we can't allow ourselves to fall into apathy and feel overwhelmed. And then we also can't kind of risk and hazard ourselves getting just totally um, so agitated and revved up that maybe we're even unavailable to those who love us. So we're just nonstop doing that work. Um, I know that there are many warriors of compassion here. So I'd, I'd love your thoughts on that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think Claudia, it's really like, there's no one answer. It's all the practices that you know so well that we share here. And it's just continuing to do whatever we can to keep our heart open without succumbing to despair and without getting um, really caught up in blame and anger because both of those make us unavailable. Yeah. So it's really, it's, a, it's just such a hard, it's hard. Um, and I think we have to stay informed, right? We can't just say, well, I'm gonna, I mean, I totally respect this, but I think this idea of I'm gonna take a news fast and that will help mm. doesn't really help. <laughs> <laughs> right? It might temporarily help us, but it's, you know, this world, unfortunately, um, things might just continue to get harder and harder. And so it's really, you know, our training to become bodhisattvas, to be able to have the spontaneous bodhicitta when suffering after suffering after suffering emerges for us. That's what we can do. Like that is that is what we have to do, actually. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I guess day to day and in our, you know, whatever we can do in our world, I guess. So. Yeah, yeah, it's, that we can. Yeah, it's um, again, and and to not get disheartened that it isn't enough. I mean, I um, yeah, there were some images in the news in this last week that. You know, I really, I had to stop and practice. Be, you know, I couldn't go on. I couldn't move on from seeing that amount of suffering. And that, of course, doesn't shift or change these people who I'm, I'm holding in my heart as I'm um, practicing. And yet, it does help me keep going so I can be here tonight. There's, there's a great question from Tanya. And then I see that um, either Pamela or Mace raised their hand, yet unclear. Um, but Tanya, just briefly, really great question on compassion and empathy 
And so with compassion, it's our heartfelt aspiration to relieve suffering. It doesn't mean we actually necessarily are doing anything. It's an aspiration that can lead to action. Empathy is a bit more complex. We can have empathy um, that is actually towards someone's joy, right? Empathetic joy or empathy that's towards suffering. Compassion is always an aspiration to alleviate suffering. And with empathy, there's a part of it that is our immediate emotional resonance, right? So hearing about like me opening um, my news app and seeing this image and immediate wash of emotion and then an appraisal, a thought of, it shouldn't be this way, or what if that was my child, or right? We have a cognitive and an emotional component with empathy. And that, um, that cognitive component can lead us towards the overwhelm. I can't. That cognitive component can lead us to the aversion. Oh, I don't want to deal. Um, and it can also lead us towards compassion and care. So the empathy in some ways, it's not that it's neutral, but the empathy can be flexible in these different components. And there's such excellent neuroscience on um, empathy. And just to now back up to Leanne's question, um, she was asking about a good book. I actually would time and time again, recommend this book. It's not explicitly um, on the preliminaries and the paramitos, but they're all in here. <laughs> and they're all in here in like secular terms. And it's not even that long of a book, but Gosh, it is such a reliable guide, um, an enjoyable read. And then I would say um, some people might be familiar or maybe not with a neuroscientist, um, Jamil Zaki. And he wrote a book last year called The War on Kindness about the neuroscience of empathy. Um, he's down at Stanford and he's done a ton of work. He's brilliant. It's such a beautiful book. I'm sure he has uh, podcasts and other other things, if you're um, wanting to check him out, I'll put his name here, Jamil Zaki. Maybe I could invite him one night to join us. Um, he's a good he's a good friend, and and he he is not familiar with the Dharma, but we could kind of invite him as a, a lateral guest to talk about empathy. He does so so beautifully. Yeah, wonderful. Pamela, thanks. Um. I was just thinking about bodhicitta also is like, I, so th this has been something for me where I sometimes get caught in this idea that like bodhicitta has to be like this heroic thing. And over and over and over again, I'm brought back to like how present it is in the ordinary. Mm -hmm. and how it, it it's almost nothing like it's all like that idea like it's just the littlest things can, can be extraordinary bodhicitta like the smallest kindnesses that we exchange between ourselves and other beings or other beings exchange you know with me mm -hmm. like you know or just like like you know listening or presence I mean that's what like in some ways like just this mindful presence is huge bodhicitta right and this capacity that maybe we develop to like be less agitated energetically in relationship with ourselves and in relationship with other beings that the the, the more soothed we are just straight up sitting there hmm. is like so soothing to other people you know like like whatever I you know I go to therapy and like there's a therapist like sitting there just being soothed right and I'm soothed and like that's bodhicitta you know mm. in this way like she's making this conscious effort you know to like show up with presence and attentiveness and listening you know and it's like and then that's like instructive you know that's mm. healing for me but then that's also you know practice is instructive in that sense because like then I'm at this isn't the I'm, I'm not trying to make a comment necessarily about the bathing suit thing but I also have a computer job right and I you know am I being present you know or am I like scrolling through the news or you know what am I doing on my little work call you know and and the relevance of that presence is is nothing in everything I, I don't know so I have that come on 
Thank you. Yeah, it's so important to keep that in mind. It's, you know, it's not these, not only our huge heroic acts in the world. Um, it's a lot of these very small, subtle. And, you know, I also, I like what you said about, you know, the people who just kind of bring that presence. Um, and for those of you who watched the summit, um, there was a closing panel with with my dad, who some of you know is a um, yeah leading figure in, in the world of emotion research and um, part of this kind of reconvening 20 years later of this meeting on destructive emotions. And my dad in, in this closing panel talked about when he met the Dalai Lama 20 years ago, he was just so blown away, not just by what he said and the ideas and like the, you know, literally thousands of research papers that have come out with that, but by the goodness of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the palpable goodness for which Western science has no words and no terms. And it just made such a huge difference in his life to know that that goodness was possible, that a human being could emanate that goodness. And His Holiness, you know, he's exceptional, of course, um, in his training and his being, and yet he would be the first one to say, I'm, I'm just a humble monk. And he's not just being humble. It's true. He's, he's a human being who has focused on goodness. And that is also within all of us. So not only not focusing just on these huge heroic acts of bodhicitta, but also not you know realizing that within us, there's quite a lot of bodhicitta going around. I'm, I'm curious when you guys prospectively imagine bringing bodhicitta to tomorrow. How did that work? Was that like possible? Did that feel motivating? I'll just throw something in because it's my favorite just fall from grace is gossip. Um, <clears throat> and it's just so hard because I love it. Um, and it's just not bodhicitta. And so, well, and especially related to work. And so when we did the prospective, like my fall today was like falling into gossip about a thing that everybody is loving to gossip about. Um, and so I just was like, yeah, tomorrow not. I don't need to, like, there's somebody in my work life that's that pretty much everybody is hating, uh, making something really important, really difficult. And I don't need to make that person bad. I don't have to like what they're doing, but I also don't need to make that person bad. And I don't need to contribute to the wild alignment against this person. So thank you. Thank you for the, the support with that. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, as you know, Mace, I, I, I don't think all gossip is bad. There's great scientific evidence that some of it is enormously helpful for sharing information, um, but I trust you to be a good um, evaluator of yourself and knowing when it really is getting in the way and actually um, contributing to that kind of falling away. And it's, you know, going also to Noam's comment here, like how do we set ourselves up for success without putting on this like whole backpack of everything I'm doing wrong and I'm bad and, you know, imagining tomorrow um, as a beautiful new day and possibility. And I, it's interesting when I've um, been fortunate enough to work with different organizations or um, institutions that ask like, what's the minimum thing we could do to help people on a day-to-day -day basis work with meditation? And I often think about that first moment when we wake up and those last moments before we go to bed. It's a precious time. Um, many of us are tired at both ends. So it's not like you're not gonna do like clear light meditation or non-dual experiences. So then why don't we do a little reflection? You know, why don't we use that time really richly to say this day ahead, using the words most meaningful for us, this day ahead, may I meet it so fully with an open heart. May I stay gentle when things are hard? And it could be that we know, for example, you know, we know, wow, I have this thing at work. It's going to, you know, may I find my lips sealed 
<laughs> may I find my hands, my pockets, right? Whatever, we can just make it really unique for us. And then at the end of the day, I do think that following up and accountability is helpful. But that tenderness towards it, right? So when we did that retrospective, we kind of hung out and just were with our bodhicitta before we went ahead and looked back to recognize maybe where we fell away. We don't want it to become a practice of um, what we did wrong. We want it to become something that is healthy and helpful for us. One of the most incredible tools we can develop as practitioners is self-awareness, right? And we can do that in meditation through inquiry, but we can do that also just honestly looking back on our day. Where did I lose it? Because I truly believe we can sustain bodhicitta every second of the day. There's actually nothing that needs to get in the way at all. And I think most of us probably are hanging out there more often than we even realize. So bringing a little bit of that awareness might also be really confidence inspiring. I got to give a, a talk today to a group of uh, nurses at UCSF, which was really um, something I, I have really loved to do. It's part of their training curriculum. And um, one woman was sharing, you know, a big feeling of regret around getting upset at her kid for doing that thing that her kid always, do, her, always does. And I can't say bodhicitta in the context of my UCSF work, but that doesn't have to be separate. We can be clear on our motivation and intention, you know, of being, hey, stop bullying your little brother. And really holding with that, that desire and care for all beings to be free. And for her, what I heard and what I hear very often is what was actually the most painful was that spiral of, of shame, right? That spiral of not healthy remorse that happened after. So bodhicitta is also in, you know, how do we treat ourselves when we fall away from our true nature? So really, I hope that that's motivating for you all. It was really motivating for me to kind of reconnect to this slogan and to the teachings I've received on it many times. And even if it's only for the next couple of days, think about waking up and going to bed with the simple kind of reflection on bodhicitta. You don't need to have the answers, just really intending it and reflecting upon it. So let's, let's give ourselves this opportunity to just come back for one or two more minutes of now that we have been really talking and I'd say kind of fanning the flames of our bodhicitta. Let's settle in and feel that this body is actually a body of compassion, a body of loving kindness, a body of joy, a body of equanimity, where we feel the bodhicitta just naturally arise, the care for other beings. And then taking a moment here, if it's comfortable to put your hands in prayer and really bring to mind anywhere in your immediate life or in the world right now where suffering is touching your heart deeply. And really exploring the edges here of where we could fall into despair. And just tilting ourselves back into bodhicitta and then tilting ourselves towards that suffering and finding the middle ground where our heart is open and luminous and light and bringing to mind the suffering of the beings that we're going to dedicate our practice tonight towards. And with these beings in our heart, extending our care 
that all beings could know belonging and safety. All beings would have ease and peace. That all beings could even experience joy and the true causes of contentment. May all beings be free. <laughs> <laughs>